Um, my name is Savannah Dodd. Uh, I'm an anthropologist and a photographer, and I founded the Photography Ethics Center in 2017. As part of the center, um, as you will all know, I developed the Photographer's Ethical Toolkit. I also have done quite a bit of writing on the topic of photography ethics. Um, I facilitated lectures and given workshops at photography festivals like Photo Ireland, the Yangon Photo Festival, um, for universities like Cambridge and the University of Queensland and a number of other professional and community groups. So I think we'll dive in. I know that there are still a couple people who have RSVP'd to the event online, um, but who aren't in, but if they come in, they'll just get into the swing of things, I'm sure. So we'll go ahead and um, I'll tell you a little bit about the rationale behind this webinar. So I don't know uh, where everybody is, is calling from, but here in the UK and Ireland, we're about marking six weeks in lockdown now. And I thought that this might be a good opportunity and a good moment to maybe stop and reflect on some of the photography ethics questions that have come up over the past few weeks of the coronavirus pandemic. So the idea, I guess, behind this, uh, this short webinar will be to apply some of the principles from the Photographer's Ethical Toolkit to some of the examples that I've seen highlighted on my Twitter feed. So we're gonna take sort of the, this, this lecture in the same order as the training. We're gonna look at the same principles. So we're gonna look at empathy, autonomy, and integrity. And as I go through, I'm gonna be mentioning um, a number of articles and examples. Um, and if you aren't familiar with these examples that I'm referencing, don't worry, because I'm going to um, try to figure out a way to provide you all links at the end. So I think we'll just launch right in. Um, as you know from the training, the, the training really started with the principle of empathy, right? And I think the first thing that that sort of came to me as I was as I was preparing this this webinar uh, and reading up on different examples of people who are photographing and documenting the coronavirus was Francesca Tosarelli's work documenting the impacts of coronavirus in Bergamo, Italy. Francesca is a filmmaker who actually worked alongside her photojournalist partner, who is Fabio uh, Bucarelli. And he actually did a webinar just a couple weeks ago with Frontline Freelance Register on safety. And Francesca also did an interview with the DART Center about ethics in uh, filmmaking. But in an article that I found where Francesca was interviewed, it's um, an article in the British Journal of Photography. She says, quote, my responsibility is to grasp the correct protocol of how to cover, at, how to cover the crisis and to have the protective equipment and respect the rules during and after shooting and to act with sensitivity, empathy, and respect for people. So I really liked this, this quote because I thought it sort of set up the conversation quite well for talking about empathy uh, while, documenting, while documenting the coronavirus. Of course, in the photographer's ethical toolkit, if you remember, we defined empathy as the ability to understand what another person might be feeling or experiencing. We talked about um, the idea of role reversal and how maybe trying to put yourself in another person's shoes might be a good way of trying to, trying to understand what it would be like to be photographed from that situation, um, which is also um, called the golden rule. So of course, the idea of you know, do unto others as you would want others to do to you. And that's a good place to start. But as we explained in the training, it's not really enough. It's not really enough because we all have our own life experience. We have our own um, thoughts and feelings and value systems. And just because I'm okay with something doesn't mean that the person that I'm photographing will also be okay with the same things. So it's important not only to practice role reversal, but to really spend time to get to know who an individual is, who the individual is that we're working with. And this is really the best way that we can get as close as possible to understanding what another person is feeling or experiencing. So, of course, with the coronavirus, this becomes very complicated 
for Francesca and Fabio, they couldn't really spend time with the people that they photographed and filmed because the people that they were working with had symptoms that were consistent with the coronavirus and their contact, um, which was facilitated through the Italian Red Cross, was limited to just a few minutes. So they were trying to spend the least amount of time possible um, actually in the presence of these people, which sort of um, is in contrast to what we're saying about the best way to develop empathy is to spend more time. So there's sort of this inherent tension and how do we, how do we really get to know these people? How do we really um, access empathy on a story like this when we have such limited contact, we don't have an opportunity to get to really know them. And they actually, um, if you're interested in their experience, they do talk quite a lot about their consent processes um, in the videos that I referenced. Um, and they also said that they, that a lot of the people that they spoke to were really um, conscious of wanting their story to be shared, really thought that the world should see um, how they were experiencing uh, the coronavirus. Um, and they're in contact actually with some of the people that they photographed still and filmed. So what do you do in that situation, right? How, how do they access empathy when they can't get to know these people, when they can't spend the time necessary to really understand their story? I think that um, Francesca and Fabio had a, uh, have a benefit in the situation of, of both also being Italian. So they have a shared experience with the people that they're working with of being from Italy. And I think that it's not to say that all Italian experience is the same. And if you're Italian, you'll know what another Italian will, will be okay with or what, what they're feeling or experiencing. Um, but it is to say that they're gonna understand the socio-political context, the cultural context, the linguistic context. They have all that background already, right? And in some ways, that shared experience of being Italian, of knowing the Italian health system, of knowing, as I said, the socio-political context, that might make them a little bit better to better able to relate to someone than if it was somebody who was not from Italy that that was photographing or who they were photographing. So I think the the key here is that what they lacked in time in in time that they could invest in that relationship, they actually had in contextual understanding and awareness at the outset. So I think that. A lot of us are finding ourselves photographing and working a lot closer to home because of the coronavirus, of course, because we're limited in, in, in our ability to travel. And so in some ways, while it can be very difficult to, to work in that context because you can't develop those kinds of relationships, you have the knowledge you need in a lot of cases. Of course, there's a lot more to learn and a lot more background that we can gain. But um, it's something that I think can definitely um, help the ability to access empathy in these situations. But a lot has been written about how the principle of representing people empathetically is often limited to those living in the global north. This could be because many of the photographs that we see are actually often produced by the global north. Um, Danielle, Danielle Villasana interviewed Nana Kofi Aqua for an article about the differences in the way that pandemics and epidemics are photographed depending on where the outbreak is and who is affected by it. And I know that a lot of people online were pointing out how the coronavirus has really been um, dominated by a lot of photos of empty streets, photos of empty shelves. Um, but also sort of positive photos of concerts on balconies or people waving to rel at relatives through, through glass. And there hasn't been a whole lot, or there haven't been a whole lot of photographs of people who are really um, physically suffering until recently. I think recently we've had more work like the work of um, Fabio and Francesca. But, um, and I think that there's sort of a disconnect that people have been, have been raising about this, about this uh, difference in representation. And Nana Kofi Aqua said, um, he, he really pointed out how European photographers have photographed, or the differences in how the European photographers have photographed the Ebola crisis in Africa versus how they have photographed the coronavirus outbreak in Europe. And he said, quote, 
it became obvious that the reason we are not seeing those gory, distasteful photographs is because people don't make those kinds of photographs about themselves. And I thought that was a really powerful quote, and I really wanted to share that here with you today. I think that the thing about this quote is that it's really all about empathy. It's about who we have empathy for, how we represent the experiences of others, and how we view ourselves in relation to the people we photograph. And I think that we could see this tension sort of come to the surface when a photograph from a Belgian hospital ward was circulated by Reuters in their Instagram. I'm not sure if you all have um, seen this photograph, but it definitely made people uncomfortable. There were many comments on the Instagram post. And I think what really came through in these comments was um, a tension between the need for the reality of the virus to be witnessed and concern for the dignity of the patient who's pictured. And he's pictured face down, naked on a hospital bed. So I think that there, there definitely there was a, a, a strong camp of people who really felt that um, we aren't seeing enough of the, the impact. We aren't seeing enough of what actually happens when someone contracts the coronavirus. But on the other hand, people were saying, well, hang on, like, that's, I wouldn't want to be him. And I think that that's an interesting, an interesting challenge there. But I think that what is perhaps even more interesting is that through this conversation, there was also an awareness that this photograph is the type of photograph that we've seen from the global south. And it's not one that we're used to or comfortable saying of the global north. Here, the patient is in Europe. The patient is white. And it is not being received the same way as if it was a patient in Uganda, for example, who was not white. So I think um, the way that that has unfolded has been very interesting and has really challenged a lot of conversations um, about empathy and empathy and how we represent people. I think that some people felt, um, some people really praised the photograph on Instagram for showing the impact, as I said, but also for replicating this visual language. A lot of people were saying, you know, we've seen this for so long of the global south. Um, if we're going to show the global south in this light, we should also show the global north in this light. But then other people felt that just because undignified photographs have been taken and shared for decades from one context, doing it in another context doesn't necessarily make it right. Um, Martha Tedes wrote a brilliant um, thread on, on Twitter, and the final tweet in that, in that thread said, quote, we need to cut the double standard, the selective outrage of what's unethical in documentation. We need to we need to stop being hypocrites and start speaking against unethical documentation for all people. So I think that maybe the, the crux of this or the conclusion to this is that, of course, people need to see the severity of the virus. People need to understand the severity of the situation. But maybe there are ways of doing it that don't put people's dignity in jeopardy. Um, I think that we can also use this example to think about autonomy. And autonomy, of course, is the second principle in the online training. So autonomy means that every person has a right to make decisions about him or herself. And uh, as I explained in the training, in order to respect a person's right to autonomy, we can ask for consent. So if we, if we were to use that same example of the patient in Brussels, we can see very clearly in the photograph that he's in no position to consent for himself at all. Um, and a lot of times, standard practice would be that if a person cannot consent for themselves, um, the, the next best thing to do is to seek consent for the next of kin or from the next of kin. But this man is unnamed. His face is not pictured. So some people have been asking um, if consent is even necessary. And I think one of the things that really challenges this is the fact that it's in a hospital in a clinical context. Different hospitals definitely have different policies, and I'm sure this varies very much from place to place. Um, I've photographed in hospital settings in, uh, in America and in Vietnam previously. Um, but regardless of, of where we're photographing, I think a lot of times what we find is that getting consent to photograph is sometimes less a matter of policy and more a matter of who you ask and what your relationship is and how you've negotiated access. I think. 
obviously medical professionals are going to be very sensitive to patient confidentiality. That's, that's really at the core of, of medicine. But they might not be as media literate as the photographer who's asking for permission. They might not know just how far a photograph can go. And that's why I think it's really important that we as photographers proceed with care for the individuals in our photographs. Just because we have permission to photograph and just because a vulnerable person is not identifiable, taking that photograph and sharing that photograph might not necessarily be the right thing to do. Now, I'm not saying that in this case, it isn't the right thing to do. I, I, I don't really want to come down on that side one way or another just yet, but, but I do think that, that it's important to understand why we are taking photographs and sharing photographs, even when we have consent. So consent isn't just that, that carte blanche, that once you have consent, you can proceed and take whatever you want. I think we need, still need to know why we're doing it and what the impact's gonna be and what the value of what we're producing is, um, especially if we're showing somebody in a vulnerable position. Um, I think, this, well, this is something that we're gonna cover a lot more in our new online training for photojournalists and documentary photographers, um, particularly in the third course, we're gonna talk a lot about impact and how understanding impact and understanding um, how our images operate, how that can help us navigate ethical decisions like this about whether or not to take a photograph and to share a photograph of someone in a vulnerable position um, and whether or not when it's necessary and, and when it isn't. So that's something that we can cover a lot more in those future courses. But in this example, I feel like I'd really love to hear from the man's family. I'd love to hear from the man himself assuming he uh, he's all right and assuming that he pulled through. I actually, I think that it would be beneficial uh, in general if we had a little bit more context about um, where he is now and how, how he's doing. Um, I'd like to know how they feel about the photograph. I'd also love to hear from the doctor in the photograph. I can't actually tell, it, and maybe maybe some of you can, but I can't actually tell if she's waving at the photographer, if she's trying to stop him. I think it's a very ambiguous um, gesture. And I, I do wonder if this photograph has impacted her in any way. So I think there are lots of questions that we could ask of the people who are pictured in this photograph. And I think that when we ask those questions and when we hear their experience, I think that that can help us as photographers to better inform our practice and to better understand how it feels to be a subject in a photograph like this. So, the final element, uh, of course, of the online training and the final ethical principle we discuss is integrity. Um, and I think the best example that I've found to talk about integrity actually uh, showed up just a few days ago from a Danish news website. And it was an article um, that demonstrated how certain aesthetic or compositional decisions can distort reality and really change how um, a viewer understands what's happening in an image. So in this photograph, or in this article, they took photographs and they did a side-by-side -side comparison. Maybe you all have seen it, but I'll describe it anyway uh, for the benefit of those who haven't. It was a side-by-side -side comparison of two photographs, and they were photographs of the same queue of people. In one photograph, it appeared that people are completely ignoring social distancing measures. People look clumped up um, with complete disregard. For, for fears of the coronavirus or public health messaging. But in the other photograph, it shows that actually in the same queue, people are appropriately spaced out. It just depended on the angle from which the photograph was taken. So the, the newspaper were using this, um, this uh, comparison as a lesson to the public, to viewers of news and consumers of news to try to be more, um, conscientious or more responsible consumers of news, which is great. But I think that this could also be used as a really good exercise to encourage photographers to become actually more aware of their own power of representation. I think that it's, it's almost, um, it can be very difficult, right? When we're the ones who are in that situation, we've seen it all, we've created photographs to reflect the situation, 
but we can't really shed the experience of having been in the situation. So I think it, it's a real skill and it takes real practice to be able to look back at your photographs as if you hadn't been there and ask yourself, how will the viewer understand the situation? And will the viewer understand the situation in a way that actually represents what I saw? And I think that, I think sometimes this is done, you know, the selective sharing of photographs can be done um, with malice, of course, but I think a lot of times it, it's just very hard to strip away that experience that you've had, that you've been there, you know what the reality was, but what happens when your photograph is taken out of context? How is that viewed on its own? And I think that's a skill that we can really um, work to hone as, a, as photographers. Because I think that the key here is that photojournalism and documentary photography have a very specific set of ethical considerations that differ from other genres like art or advertising, because the viewer trusts these images to be true. And that comes with a massive responsibility to make sure that our photographs are accurately representing reality. So in that example from the Danish paper, both photographs are true. Both photographs were taken, but only one photograph is an accurate reflection of the cue. So I think with this, we sort of get into some barriers to accuracy. And of course, one barrier that I mentioned is the fact that we were there we saw it so we might not be able to to view it as as if for the first time when we're looking back at our photographs but the other barrier is is the are the aesthetic or compositional choices that we make when we're producing photographs these aesthetic choices like focal length or perspective or framing these choices are not benign they impact the way the viewer reads our images and understands reality. They change the meaning of our photographs. So in this example, it was a choice between a zoom lens and a wide angle lens. And that's not just an aesthetic preference, it changes the meaning of the photograph. But specifically, and I think this is one of the most interesting parts of this, it changes the meaning of the photograph in today's context, in today's context of the coronavirus. But in a different context, say six months ago, prior to the coronavirus, this difference between the photographs or between the focal length wouldn't have the same meaning. Six months ago, we weren't looking at photographs and critiquing the physical distance between people in public spaces in Denmark. That wasn't, we wouldn't have been aware um, to be looking for that because it wasn't an issue then. So I think that the, the key here is that the context of where photographs are going matters just as much as the aesthetics when it comes to integrity. So that's a lot of information. That was only half an hour, but I feel like I packed in um, a fair bit of information there uh, that sort of reflects on, on uh, a bit of uh, the issues that have come out as a result of the, the coronavirus. Um, but these questions of contextual awareness, of accuracy, and of representational power, those are really the focus of our first advanced online training in photography ethics. If you all don't mind, um, I'll take just a couple minutes to briefly introduce the new training before we open for questions. Because um, this new training, it actually builds quite seamlessly in some ways from the photographer's ethical toolkit. So it's designed in such a way that uh, I hope that everybody who does the training gets a chance to look at the photographer's ethical toolkit first because I think it sets it up really nicely. But the difference is that it's designed specifically with photojournalists and documentary photographers in mind. It's a training program that will span actually the rest of 2020. And the, the program in whole is actually comprised of three different courses. So the first course is on awareness, authenticity, and accuracy, and it's currently available. The second course is on empathy, dignity, and power, and it will be released in July. And the third course is impact, intervention, and injury, which will be released in October. And in between each of these courses, um, there will be a free webinar, maybe similar to this one, might take on a different format, I'm not sure yet, but we'll be sure to have a, a moment in between each of these courses where the participants can come together, ask any questions, um, check in, make sure everybody is, uh, is comfortable and ready to, to move on to the next step before the next course is released. Um, so if you'd like to join this program, you can check out our website at www.photoethics.org 
or you can follow the link that will be provided at the end of this call, along with all the other links of the things that I referenced here today. Well, thank you all very much for joining. I hope that that was useful. Um, it was short but sweet, and I hope it uh, helped answer any questions or, or helped maybe just give a bit of reflection and a bit of summary about how we can maybe think about the Photographer's Ethical Toolkit in relation to the current outbreak. All right. Thank you very much and have a good day.